All right, welcome back, everybody. Let's get into our next interview now. South African Airways business rescue practitioners are expected to conclude their work by the end of this month. That's the end of March. The practitioners who've been working on the airline for the past 15 months have described it as solvent and liquid. SAA has cut approximately 80% of its workforce and reduced its liabilities by billions of rands. But there's still no indication of when flights will resume. SAA entered into business rescue in December 2019, following years of mismanagement of funds and looting, which ultimately left the airline unable to pay its debts. Political analyst Kaya Sitole joins us now to discuss this. Kaya, always good to see you. Welcome. Thank you and good morning to the viewers. So the business rescue practitioners, they expected to wrap up their work by the end of this month. So that's in, what, eight days' time, somewhere around there. Yes. In your view, do you think their work has been sufficient or are many things still left hanging in the air here? Well, I think we need to acknowledge the fact that they are saying that they are ready to hand back the airline in eight days' time. There's little evidence that actually indicates whether this business rescue has been a success or not. And I think the key issue here is that, unfortunately, what has always worked against them is that straight after they started the business rescue, we then had the global economic shutdown, which affected the aviation sector quite acutely. So it is quite possible that as far as they are concerned, they've done all the work relating to at least cutting off the debt and dealing with the headcount at SAA, but then on its own does not make it a viable business case because even airlines that are not in business rescue are struggling to actually sustain themselves. We are seeing record losses being declared every time that an, an airline company is reporting results. So it's difficult to imagine how SAA, which hasn't flown for such a long time, is able to do the type of projections that say, hey, the moment you actually resume operations, so many people are willing to fly, so therefore you will be a viable business. That part for me remains elusive quite simply because I don't think anyone can calculate and estimate what the appetite yeah. for the SAA is going to be on the part of the travelers. I'm I mean, we're talking 15 months of, of, of business rescue. That's how long this has gone on for. And business rescue practitioners are basically, uh, well, according to reports, are allegedly blamed government for the delay in providing the required funding for the payment of creditors and to implement the business rescue plan. What's your view on this one? I think what we've said before is that maybe the business rescue team was a bit naive in relation to how they were dealing with government because remember a lot of the issues that you mentioned earlier on that even accelerated the demise of SAA related to government lethargy, to government bureaucracy in relation to how this particular airline needed to be run. So whenever it's executive management at any point in time said, hey, we needed so much money in order for us to be able to reach as our fleet, for example, they would find themselves stuck in the fact that this airline represents a town, uh, reports at some point in time to National Treasury and to Department of Public Enterprises, and we and Jahan in particular felt that those multiple accountability structures meant that the airline couldn't be fast enough to do the type of things that it needed to do. So when the business rescue team started, they seemed to have labored under the false impression that suddenly the government had learned from the error of its space and would now acknowledge why it needs to be fast in decision making. Clearly, that has to be a, proved to be a false premise and here we are with the process that is trapped for far too long. Mm. So when we look at what's what really is at the heart of, of all of this and still is something that is outstanding is the issues around staff payment and staff uh, um, uh, uh, basically uh, uh, taking over this because there is so much money that's outstanding and staff are still sitting in the sidelines waiting. What is going to happen here now? I think the key thing, Leanne, is that it isn't just staff who've suffered some financial effects of this. We also know that the various creditors that were there at the point in time when the business really started have either been forced to take a very small fraction of what they were entitled to or they've simply given up. In the case of Comair, for example, which had eventually won that long-standing collusion case against SAA, they were owed close to 800 million rand by the time the business rescue started. And it was clear from the very inception that they were never going to get all of that amount back. So we do know that everybody that was um, either a contractor or a supplier or even a staff member to SAA has been affected. But of course, the staff members are probably the biggest victims here because imagine people going about their job only to discover and high up the value chain, the type of shenanigans that led to the collapse of the airline were indeed eventually going to 
affect their ability to have a job, a lot of them are now unemployed, and also they are uncertain about when they're going to get paid, how they're going to get paid. So I think it's been a great tragedy in particular for employees. Yeah, it, it certainly is. So let's, let's get to what it is to basically mean that um, to, we're going to secure funding for the solvent and liquid airline. What happens there? I mean, h- how do we secure funding for a solvent and liquid airline that in reality is not very solvent <coughs> and liquid? So remember, one of the long-standing theories or propositions from the Department of Public Enterprises is that they're going to secure something that they refer to as a strategic equity partner. They use such terms because, obviously, in ANC circles, it is absolutely um, unacceptable to use the term privatization, but essentially it is a form of privatization. And in relation to that strategic equity partner, we assume that whoever puts up their hand will be a person who's going to ask the core questions around the business fundamentals of SAA. They're going to have to be convinced that actually there is indeed an appetite for people to fly. They are going to have to be convinced that the type of issues that have been raised by previous executive managers of SAA, let's say these are the impediments to how we can do things easily and more flexibly, those things would need to be addressed before they then put up an amount of money. But more importantly, it's not just the day one issue, it's a question of on an ongoing basis. For as long as the government remains an extra holder, will they then actually step back and allow the operational decision making to be run by people with the capacity and the ability to run the operations? Because the history that we've seen, the testimonies we've seen at the Zondo Commission indicate that for some odd reason, government has always had a much greater fixation with this particular business compared to all other ones. And unfortunately, they've never invested in the type of resources and the type of intellectual capital that would enable them to staff it with an executive board, for example. So that particular strategic equity partner is going to have to demonstrate an inability to believe that this government can behave differently in relation to what we now know really is a vanity project as far as the government is concerned. I mean, why would it not be? You get free fights for it as a politician. What happens when the business rescue practitioner hands SAA over to the board? What, what happens then? And, 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 and what board? Is it still the same board as before? What happens next? <laughs> So the previous board eventually came alive to the fact that they actually quite simply were not clued up about how to run an airline, whether it was in business risk or not. So they thankfully evacuated the scene. So now we have an interim board that is chaired by the former CEO of the IDC, Mr. Jeffrey Kenan. It is an interim structure. So from what we understand, it is not fully staffed yet. So obviously, once it's fully staffed, then you'll have the wide expertise that is required in order for someone to say, hey, this is the board that has the ability to run SAA. So what will have to happen is that once the board gets access to essentially the business, they're going to have to ask the simple question of who are the day-to-day people that are needed in order to keep the airline viable. So you're now talking about putting together an executive management structure, and the key positions there are going to be the CEO, they're going to be the chief commercial officer, and of course the CFO, particularly when money is the issue. And then there'll be the question, the more difficult question of, is there a strategic equity partner? Who is the strategic equity partner and what is it that they've put through as demands? Do they, for example, want to allocate a particular seats on the board? Do they want to be overseeing the process relating to the employment of these new executives? So there's going to be a lot of behind-the-scenes groundwork that this new board would have to get into place while also monitoring the developments in the global aviation sector and also in the local aviation sector to figure out when will SAA eventually be in a position to fly. And then operation. Once they have the data, they have an idea of when they'll be able to fly. Well, remember, a pilot cannot sit idle for 10 years and wake up and say, I don't want to fly. So suddenly the pilots, whoever they decide to hire, are have to go to resume their training and, you know, their familiarity with how the operations work. So there's going to be a lot more work happening away from the visibility of the public eye before we see the next SAA flight taking over to wherever it needs yeah. to be. No way to that will be. And, 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 that's, and that's the reality is that um, I'm so, uh, apologies to, to viewers if they're not able to hear you. I know your, your, um, your link is breaking up a little bit, but we'll, we'll, we'll persevere and hope that we're getting the main message across. I mean, 
we're in the middle of, of a pandemic. South Africa, I, I, I've been reading, I mean, in terms of countries that have been barred from traveling for, to various destinations around the world, South Africa sits right close to the top of that list of countries that have been barred, obviously because of the strain that, the, that was discovered here in South Africa, and people are very, very worried about that, and due to the fact that our vaccine rollout is just at a dead standstill at this point in time. So to A, get SAA flying is a challenge to destinations, to find the will inside people to travel once again, to use an airline that has... Let's be honest, it's been grounded for how many months and who services those planes? I mean, it costs a lot of money to keep those planes in the sky and in good condition. And then finally, trying to find a funder from the private sector in times like this, when airlines all around the world are struggling. Mm -hmm. These are huge considerations, every single one of those to keep in mind when we further this discussion. Yeah, I mean, Leanne, you said something quite contentious here. You said our vaccine rollout program is at a standstill. We do not have a vaccine rollout program in South Africa because according to the Department of Health, all we have is actually a trial that is being run under the guise of a vaccine rollout program. It is very difficult to get a very clear-cut answer of where we are in the vaccine rollout. We do know that the champion of the vaccine rollout program was supposed to be the Deputy President E.T. Mabuza, and there he was at the National Council of Provinces last week saying, oh, by the way, that commitment that we say to say we're going to get to a million vaccines by a particular date. Sorry, we cannot meet the deadline. We still do not know at this stage when we're going to get really the high volumes of messages that are required to say we are now starting the massive vaccine rollout program because if we're still talking about our healthcare workers only, that is not essentially the vaccine rollout program that we were promised. That is not the vaccine program that I mean, sort of indicated that they will be starting. So we really don't should be referring to the country's vaccine rollout program quite simply because it does not exist. And in relation to SAA, yes, you're perfectly right. And that unfortunately, all the fundamentals relating to where we are ranked by other countries in terms of opening up their borders are really, really quite bad. The emergence of that new stream would have created additional anxieties for border controls across the different parts of the world who would then say, guys, until you know exactly what it is that you're dealing with, more importantly, until you can demonstrate to us that you've got a high vaccine rollout program, which means that whatever stream may be prevalent at the country at any point in time is not something that you're going to be transplanting into other countries. Yes, of course, we will delay the approvals for SAA flights, for example, to be flying back into other countries. So it is going to be an intersection of the healthcare considerations and the economic considerations. But the greatest variable is going to be the question of will anyone trust SAA enough to say, I will book my flight? Because remember, even back in December 2019, people had booked flights for the holiday season. People had booked flights for the Easter season only to be told that the airline no longer exists. And because of the way the bookings process works in the airline uh, uh, model, you do not wake up and decide to book an international trip overnight. You want to do it in advance. And of course, that means that you're going to be taking a gamble and hoping that SAA will be around in three or six months' time mm. when they decide to travel. So that variable, the consumer appetite and the consumer trust in the airline is going to be the biggest challenge after if you felt People will say, we quite simply do not trust this airline until there's a demonstrated track history of them sticking to the promise. Yeah. Kaya, in 10 seconds, one word answer. Is SAA worth saving? No, it hasn't been for a while. I mean, it's better. Um, <laughs> it's better spend the money on things that it can manage properly. Because what I now know is that it may be one or two days, but they'll come back and start interfering again. In three or four years' time, we'll never have a all right, Kaya Sitola, thank you. Thanks for talking to us. Talking about the state of SAA, as the business rescue practitioners say, they're concluding their work at the end of this month and they hand it back over to the board and we see what happens thereafter. Quick break, news at seven after this.